doubt about it, video games are packed with trends that repeat themselves time and time again. Some of these cliches, like the use of chanting and music to make situations more epic, can be so entertaining that to us it doesn't matter how overused they are. But then, there are those cliches that you just shake your head at whenever you see them. The ones that just suck. Now, I'm going to go critical and list what I think are the absolute worst of these recurring trends. So get ready for the top 10 worst video game cliches. I'm sure by now you all know how much I love final boss battles and how I especially love the build-up to some of these battles. But of course, not every finale is like that. Oh no, then we have those final bosses. You know, the final bosses that come right the f*** out of nowhere and always leave you wondering whether it's actually the final boss? These battles are complete anti-climaxes, always ruining the emotional intensity of the game you're playing. Likely the most infamous example is Necron from Final Fantasy IX, a boss who appears at the last minute, has an ambiguous backstory, and is wholly unoriginal. I mean, wow! Not only does this guy have glaring similarities to X-Death, but he also directly rips off dialogue from Yoda! Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. That's just shameful! When the final boss of a game is something that we haven't been anticipating like Necron, the fight just comes across as not just rushed, but a complete letdown. Aw oh yeah, Symphony of the Night, we're starting off strong, we're killing enemies and- Wait, what? Oh f*** you! Now I have to get all of my items back! Situations where you lose all your powers annoy me, especially when you get used to some of the abilities given to you at the start. When you suddenly lose them, it really throws you off by how weak you become and how enemies you could have easily overcome earlier become much harder to kill. Sometimes the situation in which you lose your abilities is completely ridiculous. In Metroid Prime, you lose your abilities after just getting thrown against a wall! This cliché is undeniably terrible, but it isn't too bad if you get new abilities that you didn't have earlier to compensate. To me, half the fun of boss battles is discovering how you beat them. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be what certain game developers had in mind. Especially in Nintendo-developed games, boss fights keep displaying obvious weak spots that are downright insulting to people's intelligence. The Mario Galaxy series is practically synonymous with this practice. Bowser Jr. outright tells you what the weakness of Gobblegut is, even in spite of how blatantly obvious its weak points are to discover. And then there are just some bosses that- Dear God, am I seeing this right? This boss's weak spot couldn't be more obvious even if it were flashing, had arrows pointing to it, and had a neon banner on the weak spot saying, HIT ME! This is also prominent in adventure games like the Zelda series, where in almost every dungeon the boss is killed in some way by the main weapon that is found in there. That's just as bad because it's like that in nearly every game in the series. Try something new for once! Fetch quests are where you travel around the entire world either looking for certain items, certain people, or trading items. These situations can be boring, but if it's accomplished as the game flows on, fetch quests are actually pretty enjoyable. There are some instances in games, however, where you travel back and forth between certain areas multiple times, seeing the same things over and over again, and all the while while likely being forced to travel by foot. The game that to me is synonymous with such awful backtracking moments is Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. In nearly every chapter, there is some form of repetitive situation, whether this means traveling between Twilight Town and Creepy Steeple and always fighting the same respawning enemies, 
searching for General White in the most boring fetch quest of all time, and worst of all, going all the way through a jungle and back to get a wedding ring! Yeah, because you totally think of the Godfather when playing a Mario game. Personally, I think I'll just stick with the N64 Paper Mario. HEY, I'M GETTING OLD HERE! This is a tie between the two most overused obstacles in gaming history, bottomless pits and spikes. Both of these obstacles have been around since forever. We've seen bottomless pits ever since Super Mario Bros., and spikes gained a ton of popularity with the rise of the Mega Man series. But since then, both of these obstacles have spread like cancer to almost every other video game series ever. Half of their appearances in games don't make a lot of sense. I mean, where do all the bottomless pits lead to in the Mushroom Kingdom? To the underground? Well, that can't be right, I mean, a few stages are underground. So, does the underground only let people survive when it feels like it? The Mega Man series uses the bottomless pit and spike cliches to death in every game in the series, especially in Dr. Wily's Fortresses. In the first Mega Man, there are so many spikes in Wily's fortress that it makes you wonder how Wily gets around his fortress each day without getting gored on his own death traps. Cave Story also features spiked plants that mostly kill you in one hit. What purpose does that serve other than making an already repetitive and frustrating game even more repetitive and frustrating? Why are there plants growing underground, anyways? Why does Cave Story hate me so much? And why do people keep using these generic obstacles? Ha <laughs> ha! I'm not a capitalist. So whenever I see someone make an ending to a game that signals an obvious cash-in sequel, I feel a bit of my faith in humanity die inside. If you're going to make an ending to a video game that obviously indicates a sequel, at least have some dignity and make it entertaining! You know, because video games are entertainment? Arguably the most infamous example is the ending of Halo 2, where Master Chief says he's going to finish the fight, only to have Halo 2 end right after he says this. But in my opinion, the absolute worst ending of this kind comes from Mega Man 4, where Dr. Wily escapes his fortress by getting out through a secret door! Yeah, that pretty much says, Thanks for playing! Get ready to fork over your 20s for Mega Man 5 in a few months! Gah! Let's face it, a dark past is almost always necessary for character development, especially for heroes. But do they always have to brood over it? No, no they don't. Characters that have a dark past in video games will very often take any given opportunity to monologue about every single depressing detail about their past, especially with the rise of voice acting. Not even a fragment. None of the baby remained on me. I knew it to be true, but still couldn't help looking at my palm for a sign. Never again would I encounter the baby. Never. The finality of it struck me once again. The worst part about this is, many characters with dark pasts don't seem to develop much. Final Fantasy VII's Cloud still keeps brooding on in Advent Children, even after he defeats Sephiroth for the first time. Metroid Samus is emotionally scarred by Ridley, showing this in Prime 3 by attempting to violently finish him off, and literally freezing in fear after seeing the terrifying beast revived unexpectedly in Other M. And Shadow the Hedgehog has to have the most cliched of all backstories. The fact that he doesn't remember anything. Nobody's perfect. People still love these characters despite their flaws. But if a character broods on for the whole game, it gets very annoying because it seems that brooding is all that these characters can do! Cutscene deaths are annoying, but at least they're, well, deaths. 
If you're going to go through all the drama of having a character enter a near inescapable deadly scenario, at least respect common sense and have the character actually die! The undisputed king of fake deaths is Final Fantasy IV, where only one major character dies, even despite there being four other scenes where characters appear to die! All of the characters in question, except for Tella, reappear very much alive after their supposed death scenes, and continue to fight another day! What's worse is that these survivors survive after the most impossible situations, an example of which is Young, who is saved from an exploding room by fairies. But worst of all is Sid, an old man who survives detonating a grenade in order to block a rocky cavern to the underworld, all the while while falling from the sky! What do you know? Haven't you heard of suspension of disbelief? Yeah, but I've also heard of completely ruining a dramatic moment. Hmm, that reminds me. I once in a lifetime hunted! <laughs> I've been ranting about unoriginal concepts throughout this whole list, and now that we're in the top two, it's time to tackle one of the big ones. Unoriginal villains. You know what I'm talking about. Those unthreatening hacks that just stand around, monologue constantly, and always laugh, and somehow manage to do all of this while not getting killed mid-speech or mid-laughter. The absolute worst offender of this kind, by far, is X-Death from Final Fantasy V. Apart from having a backstory that may as well have been made with Mad Libs, nothing about this guy is subtle. All he does is boast, monologue, and laugh. I'm not exaggerating. Before the final battle with him, he literally does all three! I don't think I need to say anymore. This cliche speaks for itself. You hate them. I hate them. Everyone known to man hates them. You ask what I'm talking about? The answer will likely make you convulse with bad memory-induced rage. Well, this is it. The worst cliche in gaming history is the underwater level. Oh god! These levels are always ALWAYS a total pain! The physics of the game is ALWAYS altered in these sections, almost NEVER for the better. Widely considered the most frustrating level in Zelda history, Ocarina of Time's Water Temple perfectly exemplifies my hatred for water-related stages. The amount of times you will switch the water levels, put on your iron boots, as well as scream in agony is so mind-blowing that Shigeru Miyamoto himself regrets the Water Temple's design. 2D platformers are abominable with regards to their water levels. The Sonic series will have you literally drown if you stay underwater for too long, and controls are slippery underwater. Gravity is altered underwater in the Mega Man series. Coupled with spikes, the increased gravity underwater will be the death of you. I wonder if the designers of these 2D stages have ever been in water before. You do not sink in water. You float on top of the water. What do you know? Haven't you heard of- SHUT UP! It only seems to make sense in the Metroid series, where Samus is in a heavy metal suit of armor. And even then, her movement is hindered! Honestly, these levels are unavoidable. But because of how shockingly patience-trying these levels are, we almost never enjoy their repeated appearances. These levels are practically always the ones that aggravate us the most. I'm the Autark of Flame, and I think that underwater levels are the worst video game cliché of all time. Slimy Spring Galaxy is pretty awesome, though. Somebody turn on the lights! I can't see shit!